Samuel Slater was a classist jerk. Some of you are going to be saying, wasn't he also a racist? Here you go with your class reductionism again. And some of you are going to be saying, but wait, who is Sam Slater? All right, well, so uh, let's back up a bit. You know how Eli Whitney created the cotton gin back in 1789, and famously it bolstered the slave trade and made a bunch of southern plantation owners very, very rich. But the cotton has to go somewhere after it's grown, and it gets turned into clothes. And so the people that turn the cotton into clothes, they are also going to get a bunch of cotton all of a sudden that they can turn into way more clothes than they could before if they are able to handle it quickly enough. And Samuel Slater is those people. Samuel Slater built the first completely water-powered cotton mill up in Rhode Island, but he was very, very lucky that he was able to do so because he got indentured to the right people in order to learn how to do that. And then he hid his identity when he moved to America from Britain so that he could take advantage of the market conditions. So you could say he was something of a corporate spy, but I wouldn't say it is that because that makes him sound cool, and he was not cool. If it wasn't for the War of 1812, his business never would have really taken off. In the early days, his business relied on there being trade disputes between Britain and the United States, which gave a huge comparative advantage to American textiles if they could be manufactured. Then when those trade disputes eventually broke out into the War of 1812, that gave him a huge advantage because he was able to provide clothes and blankets to the soldiers going up to Canada to fight the British. So the military and industry were intertwined back from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. He was very much a rigid moralist. He didn't like drinking, he didn't like gambling, he didn't like having fun. You think of the rich today as wanting everyone else to work long hours while they have all the leisure time for themselves. But from all indications, Sam Slater spent all his time just opening more and more and more businesses and having a bunch of kids. But other than that, it doesn't seem like he had any sort of fun. And he absolutely despised it when his workers had fun. He wrote that man was put upon the earth to labor. And if he wasn't around to make sure that everyone was laboring, then they would all die out because they would not be able to know what to do. Listen to what he wrote in his memoir about labor. A man is born to labor as the spikes fly upward. We dispute not the authenticity of this text no more than of the original. But why is he born to labor? The simple reason is that in the most spontaneous and fertile regions, the fruits of the earth drop not into his mouth. Were this the case, few would be found willing to give any extraordinary exertion to procure them in any other way. The necessity of exertion to procure infers the right of possession and enjoyment when attained, and hence arises a notion of property, or right of using what has been obtained by the outlay of labor. And further, what has luckily adverted to its possessor by discovery or chance. But in order to fully secure the possession of such acquirements, it is more than necessary that the use should be yielded to the reward of the exertion of achievement. It is requisite that full right should accrue to the individual to retain or dispose of such fruits of toil in any manner or direction that he may think proper, barring the direct injury or annoyance of his neighbor. And then listen to what he wrote later on in his memoir about the dangers of collectivism. But the agrarian spirit, unhappily too dry from this country, if it were permitted sway, must speedily root up the foundations, not alone of our property, but of our whole system of liberty and laws. And to none could it prove more injurious than to those who imagine that great advantage lies to themselves in the change. That portion of freedom and property which is yielded in the exchange for the protection of law and the preservation of order redounds most forcibly to the advantage of those who apparently have the least at stake. The wealthy, and otherwise powerful, have or may create means of resistance to popular or individual rapacity. They may gather friends or hire mercenaries, but these means of protection are not within the compass of the small possessor, and in all turbulent or violent changes, the greatest miseries have been undergone by the poor and weak, while on the other hand, under the steady operation of orderly systems, they have been gradually advancing in comfort and consideration. And then listen to him complain later on about how he isn't being revered as this great philanthropist. It must 
be confessed, however, that there is small hope to cheer the true philanthropist so long as the present defective and injurious education prevails, and especially while we continue the importation of foreign ignorance and agitation principles. Better views must be imparted to the laborer than he can obtain from trades union lectures or the orations thundered forth at strike meetings. In place of considering the man who has husbanded the proceeds of his labor for himself or his children as a common robber of the human family, such must be considered as the true benefactors of the race, inasmuch as in no case could mankind have been in the enjoyment of the comforts by which they are now surrounded, were it not for the savings thus accumulated. That's right. That's right. You lot wouldn't be able to do anything at all if it weren't for us bosses telling you to do things. So Samuel Slater did not own any slaves, but that's just because he was out in Rhode Island and slavery was illegal in Rhode Island at the time. We can see in his memoirs that he very much thought that slavery would take over the United States and that this would be a much more effective system than the system he had of hiring families and children and paying them very low wages and making them work 12 hours a day, six days a week, and then going to church on Sunday so that they could be indoctrinated with the Puritan work ethic and principles of subjugation to capitalist authority. And the idea that laboring is the more, most moral good you could do and being idle is a moral evil. Sam Slater brought over the idea of having a church and a school nearby the town and basically turning the town into a company town. Here's a quote from his wife's brother about his cotton mill and how he handled the morality of his town. You ask my opinion as to the tendency of manufacturing establishments on the morals of the people. I answer that my said opinion is that the natural or consequent influence of all well-conducted establishments is favorable to the promotion of good morals for the following reasons. The helps are required to labor all the time, which people can sustain in regular service through the year consistent with what is necessary to attend to their personal wants, for meals, sleep, and necessary relaxation, and a proper observance of the Sabbath, the usual working hours being twelve exclusive meals, six days in the week, the workmen and children being thus employed have no time to spend in idleness or vicious amusements. In our village, there is not a public house or grog shop, nor is gaming allowed in any private house, if known by the agent, and very few instances have occurred in twenty-nine years, to my knowledge. In collecting our help, we are obliged to employ poor families, and generally those having the greatest number of children, those who have lived in retired situations on small and poor farms, or in hired houses, where their only means of living has been the labor of the father and the earnings of the mother while the children spend their time mostly at play. These families are often very ignorant and too often vicious, but being brought together into a compact village, often into the family, and placed under the restraining influence of example, must conform to the habits and customs of their neighbors, or be despised and neglected by them. Thus it happens sometimes that when it becomes generally known that a family are noted for any vice, they are neglected by the rest, and no person, male or female, will visit or be seen keeping company with them, who is at all concerned to sustain a good name. Another reason is, by being in a way to earn the means, they almost invariably clothe better, and it is a fact of common notoriety that the females employed in factories clothe better or more expensively than others in similar circumstances as to property or even in the daughters of all respectable farmers. But this disposition to dress extravagantly soon abates, and the helps contract habits of economy and lay up their wages by loaning the money at interest. I have known a great many who have laid aside two hundred to three hundred dollars in from the three to four years and were enabled to fit themselves out decently when married for housekeepers. Others who remained single laid by four, five, and some seven and eight hundred dollars and now have it out on interest. As public opinion goes far in regulating the moral habits and behavior of cities and towns, so it does in manufacturing villages. By this influence, it is an established fact that if a female is introduced into a factory of bad or loose character, 
She must be discharged as soon as her character is fully known, or the rest of the female help will quit the mill. Perhaps I cannot furnish better proof of the practical tendency and effect on female characters than to state that in 29 years, during which time I have had the sole agency of palm from cotton manufacturing establishment, I can assume that but two cases of seduction and bastardry have occurred. One of these was by means which have often proved fatal, where the object was placed in the most disadvantageous circumstances to withstand them. The company very early exerted their influence in establishing schools and introducing public worship on the Sabbath. In 1812, they erected a convenient brick building to answer as a schoolhouse and a place for holding meetings, which is now occupied for those purposes and has been ever since its first erection. But there is at least one really good story that I love telling about Sam Slater and his life. In 1824, he and the other mill owners wanted to lower the wages and increase the time work by the women in the town. When everyone heard about this, the women led a strike, and it only took a week of strikes for the mill owners to completely give up. Part of this was because the mill owners hadn't learned yet to separate themselves from the rest of the village, and so the villagers were just able to go up to their houses and throw rocks through the windows, and then throw insults through the windows as well. One of the mills caught on fire, and it was the very next day that the strike ended and they were able to go back to work because the mill bosses gave in to all their demands. And really what this goes to show is that for all the posturing, the owning class is terrified of collective action. And so collective action is the way we will win. It also doesn't hurt to do anything you can to just make the world a better place. I'd like to thank all of you for watching. You can check out my sources in the description. Make sure to like, leave a comment, subscribe. And I'd be very grateful if you could donate to my coffee, or even better, sign up for a monthly subscription. That allows me to eat and pay rent, and having some guaranteed income really goes a long way towards allowing me to take my time so that next time you can get a video that's even better than this one. Once again, thank you for watching and just make the world a better place as I know you will.